Hey for the Wild community, it's Ayana here speaking to you from the northern Boreal Forest. Madison and I are en route to southeast Alaska for the Tongass campaign, and being amongst these trees and the mosses remind me of the episode we did with Ariel Deranger on the tar sands in this ecosystem. So if you want to learn more about where we're at and the threats that are facing this ecosystem, listen to the episode with Ariel Deranger. It's really one of my favorites. We are building up our One Million Redwoods research team, so if you're interested in supporting our research, if you have a background, if you are in academia or not, and you'd like to get involved, email us at engage at forthewild.world. All this month, we'll be releasing staff-picked episodes. It's a real treat for us to dig back through the glorious archive and share a few of the encores of the ones that have really stuck with us the most. This week is Andrew Storr's pick, our producer and editor. He's such an incredible member of the team, and thank goodness he's a Capricorn. <laughs> and lastly, if you value this podcast, please become a member on Drip. We're about to release a new batch of bonus material and other goodies, so you can sign up at d.rip slash four dash the dash wild. This podcast could not continue without your support, so we are so extremely grateful for those of you who have supported us on Drip. And if you haven't, please consider becoming a member. All right, now on to the show. Hi there. I'm Andrew Storrs, the editor and producer of For the Wild Podcast. Speaking to you from my home in the high desert of Yucca Valley, California. In last week's Encore episode, Robin Wall Kimmerer spoke to the need for revitalizing our ability to learn from the land. This week, Janine Benyus describes how she puts a practice like that into action around the globe, looking to nature as model, measure, and mentor, encouraging us to be more plant-like, in order to, and I quote, create conditions conducive to life. <laughs> The silence is broken by somebody crying Trying to be heard, never a word Always the attitude, sort out your own Always alone, wishing for something The world is denying Out in the wilderness, somebody's crying Somebody wishing for something to happen Wishing to tell, wishing to help Someone was listening, someone who cared Never despaired Someone to lean on and someone to trust Who needs your assistance and finds your disgust Hello and welcome to For the Wild Podcast. I'm Ayana Young. Today we are speaking with Janine Benyus. Janine is known worldwide for her influence in naming the practice of biomimicry in her seminal book, Biomimicry, Innovation Inspired by Nature. Her work is shaping the practice as an innovation tool that can solve some of humanity's most pressing challenges. She is the co-founder of Biomimicry 3.8, the world's leading bio-inspired consultancy, and the Biomimicry Institute, a nonprofit that empowers people to create nature-inspired solutions for a healthy planet. Undoubtedly, the most recognized thought leader in the field, Janine's legacy includes inspiring millions through her work as an innovator, speaker, and as the biologist at the design table, using 3.8 billion years worth of brilliant, time-tested solutions. So Janine, I am sincerely honored to have you on the show today. Your life's work energizing humanity to once again live humbly as a fledgling organism on earth is just, just truly incredible. And my deepest welcomes to you, Janine. Oh, thank you for having me. I just want to jump right into biomimicry and the idea to look to nature for innovation. And it really sparks awe of the brilliant adaptations that surround us in every ecosystem. 
I've heard you say that amidst such immense earthly diversity, life carries a hidden unity. So I'd love if you could begin by telling us some of the unifying principles of life and how our industrial approach to science and synthetic chemistry are fundamentally incompatible with such life-sustaining principles. That's a great place to start. I've spent my life in the natural world and reading about the natural world and writing about the natural world. And there is this hidden unity in the diversity. It's, it's what gives me hope, actually, because we are part of nature, obviously. And so the impulse to do this is within us as well. What organisms do is they find a way over long periods of evolutionary time. This is rewarded over and over again, this impulse, which is to continue life over the long haul and to fit in over the long haul. And what organisms are always doing, of course, is taking care of their, of their offspring. But what they really do, the really the ones that have succeeded and have been here, you know, over this 3.8 billion years, they're the ones that have figured out that in order to take care of your offspring, not just in this generation, but 10,000 generations from now, the only way you can do that is to take care of the place that's going to take care of your offspring. So what life has learned to do is build soil, clean air, purify water and cycle nutrients. And in that, in everything that life does, life creates conditions conducive to life. So that really, for me, is the design brief of our time. You know, if we, as a part of nature, and as, as you said, a young species on this planet, if we're gonna become a welcome species on this planet, we have to learn to create systems that in everything we do, the byproduct is creating conditions conducive to life. And life, you know, life does that in, in life friendly ways. Okay. So you mentioned, for instance, how we make things, how we relate to the material world. Life has to manufacture its shells and its, its webs and its nests in the same in or near its own body. So in order to do that, it has learned how to use non-toxic chemicals and to create non-toxic chemicals, how to make materials at body temperature and in water. You know, if you think about a spider's web, five times stronger ounce for ounce than steel. And yet it's basically, you know, the flies and crickets that fly into the web and and then those are manufactured at, at room temperature, right, at body temperature and in water, using this safe subset of the periodic table. When you start to see, we call them life's principles. We've basically looked at what do all organisms have in common, or most organisms have in common. And that's one of the things is how they make things. You know, they use current solar energy. They make things in ways that allow them to live in or near their manufacturing plant. And you think about, well, could we possibly do that? And there are people working on that, working on these fields of green chemistry, self-assembly, water-based chemistry, rather than, rather than toxic solvents, low-pressure chemistry, low-temperature chemistry. There are people working on this, and when you, when you learn how to do chemistry in that way, and, you know, that's at the basis of everything that we make, you are starting to be more and more plant-like, right? You're becoming more like the organisms that are outside my window right now and in every moment are creating miracle materials silently and in ways that I don't need to wear a hard hat or eye goggles, right, or a gas mask. So that's our future if we're going to fit in here, is to figure out how to how to do everything we do, not just in making things, but how we build and how we power ourselves, how we grow our food in ways that create conditions conducive to life. Goodness, thank you so much for that. Mm. Just a beautiful introduction. And this is a thought that I sometimes struggle with. And I see that as there are infinite, unique expressions of Earth, 
there's also infinite innovations to possibly develop. But I question how we make decisions on where our creative impetus and energy is best put. I'm so excited about biomimicry for earth renewal, but I'm also wary of corporations and industry abusing biomimetic principles to perpetrate this overconsumptive death culture. And I would just love to hear your thoughts on how and where we draw the line to ensure biomimicry is not exploited to prolong the unnecessary selfish comforts of human civilization, but instead helps humans find a harmonious place for the long haul. Let's, let's look at that. I certainly do. You know, 20 years ago when I started to see this field evolving, emerging, it was a very faint signal at that point. And I also thought, wow, is this, is this going to be the next gold rush that we, as Francis Bacon said, torture nature for her secrets and then use, use that knowledge to, to build a more efficient well, right? A more efficient way to extract from, from the earth. I thought long and hard about what are the questions when you come to the natural world with, with a question about how you should, how shall we live here? The questions are, what would nature do here whenever you're about to design something? What would nature do here? And the here is very important because it has to do with what's appropriate locally because the world is not monolithic. And the second question is what wouldn't nature do here, which is just as important. So biomimics also look at what is not very common in the natural world. Transgenic engineering, putting, you know, finding fish genes inside strawberries to produce frost resistant strawberries, that doesn't happen, right? And there's something teaching us in that. And the third question after what would nature do here and what wouldn't nature do here, the question is why and why not? Because if you're looking at nature as model, emulating nature, you can do that and create a torpedo that is shaped like a penguin, which has been done. But if you don't ask that next question, which is what wouldn't nature do here, right? So would nature use these things in the service of destroying wantonly? No, <laughs> no. And why and why not? That's, that's nature as, as mentor, right? Looking at nature as mentor. So you look at nature as model, as measure, and as mentor. Um, asking why and why not, um, that's where we sort of learn the ropes of how to be an earthling, right? You look at the natural world and you say, how is it that nature is not just creating more stuff? You know, right? nature doesn't create things. It creates things that disappear into systems. When you do biomimicry at a deeper level, not just a shallow, we're going to recreate the form or the shape of something, um, we ask the people that we work with to also look at not just the form, but also how would nature make this? You know, what's the process? And then what is the ecosystem level strategy? You know, what is this necessary, this thing that we're building? Is it beautiful? Does it fit within an ecosystem that will eventually regenerate the planet? And when we work with corporations, at this time in history, you're working with the people who make our world. So they are us. We use what they make for us. So it's our system right now. And we believe that if we're not working there, we're not, we're not going to get through this evolutionary knothole. I mean, we really, in order to scale these kinds of ideas, we have to have small companies, um, NGOs, municipalities, communities, and corporations starting to follow some of these design principles. Otherwise, I, I, uh, I fear we'll lose a lot more of the biodiversity that we love if we're not working to change from the inside out. And I mean from the inside of the person out. The people we work with, the champion adapters, we call them, the champions inside of these companies, they're sort of roller skating in the halls of power 
Um, many of them are people who want to see their grandchildren have a different life. So they're trying to change things from within. And for us, that means changing how we make things and also how we actually run the, the companies that we work in. What's interesting now is that can nature, can we ask questions like how does nature cooperate? How does nature communicate? How does nature network? But all of these things have to, just like anything, biomimicry is an innovation methodology, a way to find new solutions, new solutions that have been on the planet for long, long periods of time, new to us. And it can be used for any ideology. So the question of what's worth doing with biomimicry is enormously important. And we answer that question by asking what would nature do here? What wouldn't nature do here? Why and why not? Because life on earth has figured out what works, what's appropriate, what lasts, and also what's worth doing. The deeper why lessons, why are we doing this, can also come from the natural world. That's what we're trying to bring to innovators everywhere. I think about how we can do things on scale with integrity. And it's a question that I think we need to ask ourselves, just like how you're saying, what would the earth do? Why would the earth do? In what way? And it feels so necessary to be able to bring those questions in when we are designing the systems that we want to live in. Now I'd like to ask you about biomimicry and regional landscape and urban design. And I was just astounded to read about the project you worked on in Lavasa near Mumbai, which receives 27 feet of water during monsoon season. And from what I understand, the development, which was inspired by the native forest capacity to withstand such intense rains without significant erosion, yielded a 30% reduction in carbon emissions, 65% reduction in potable water consumption, and a 95% reduction in waste sent to the landfill. So would you tell us more about or how this design came about? And then how does it emulate the native forest and does it incorporate the concept of a circular economy, which is guided by waste-free flows in the natural world? This was an, a development, and it was a master plan for a development. And we've been asked quite a bit in the last 20 years to work on city planning, urban planning, all the way down to the building scale, regional urban planning all the way down to the building scale. And the question became, what is a biomimetic community? What is it? And for us, if you want your community to function like an ecosystem, the gold standard for that, the ideal for that, would be to look for local ecosystems, the healthiest local ecosystems you can find, the wildland next door. Go there and ask, what are the ecosystem services, that is the beneficial services being produced by this healthy ecosystem? Because really, that's the exhale of a healthy ecosystem. It's the signature of a healthy ecosystem, is what it gives away. So clean air, how much air does it clean a year? How much per acre? How much water does it clean? How much water does it store in a storm? How much sediment does it retain and keep from eroding? That's what we do. We call these ecological performance standards. We say that a community should be functionally indistinguishable from the wild land next door. And that's a really aspirational goal for any community. I mean, right now, you know, Living Building Challenge and other things are looking at net zero, creating, you know, basically meeting your own needs on site. The next step is, can we actually produce positive ecosystem services, right? Can the air leaving our community be cleaner than it was when it came in? It's just incredible. Can we create corridors for wildlife, right? Can we store the amount of water that we need and then some to send on more water downstream? This is what ecosystems do, right? So we're challenging ourselves to meet those metrics. We call them generous cities because we see ecosystems as being generous, you know? What we did in Lavasa, one of the 
cool things. We did know we our reference habitat, our healthy habitat was the Western Ghats, which is an ecological hotspot that's been heavily um, studied. Thank goodness for us. The land that we were working with was a very hilly area. And again, in these monsoons, just rivers of red earth would run into the lakes and, and paint the lakes red. Literally, they were bringing bulldozers down into the lake dump trucks and getting the sediment back and bringing it back up on the hillsides. It was incredible. But when we went to the Western Ghats, we saw that there was, even in these monsoons, there was very little erosion. So that became 100% erosion control became the goal of this so that they changed the way they did the, the um, foundations they changed the way they did the roadways, all kinds of things on the landscaping to make sure that there was, you know, there were awnings on, and the buildings and the eco structure or the green spaces. We asked those cumulatively to produce these ecosystem services, right? So we were saying, okay, well, one of the ways that this rainfall is intercepted uh, is in all the layers of the moist deciduous forest. So can we recreate that layering? in our buildings with awnings, with kinds of landscaping that's going to cover the ground completely, and also the kinds of vegetation that's going to intercept raindrops so they lose all of their damaging energy. So that became really a design model for the development. But the coolest thing was that we realized that the moist deciduous forest from the top, like if you were flying over it, you'd see this rolling canopy of dark, dark leaves, right? And trees at different heights, but they have this rolling appearance. And what happens is that wind going over that during the monsoon, up to 30% of the water is turned into water vapor and is volleyed back up into the clouds. And those clouds go to inland India and water inland India. So they call it a monsoonal engine. And what we're doing when we cut those trees, we lose that capability. Now, on this site, this site had been degraded for about 400 years. It hadn't had trees on it for 400 years. It had been degraded by uh, overgrazing of goats. And so what we were doing was a restoration project in many ways. But we said that the buildings themselves, they were sort of these uh, townhouses close. Think of like Italian Hill country sort of housing. And we said, why don't we make the roof lines different heights and with green roofs? So we recreate this hydro canopy, we called it, in our building. And we contribute to watering inland India. That idea, we, we would never have asked ourselves if we hadn't compared the function to how the wildland next door was performing. And this is what's really interesting to me about this exercise of comparing yourself to the wildland next door. The designs are very different as a result because the questions are different. For so long, we've asked, you know, will our buildings keep us well, right? That's the new thing now, well.org, you know, well buildings. When we're inside the building, is the air quality good for us? Does it remind us of nature being inside the building? And I'm thinking, Let's also extend that wellness outside the walls of the buildings, right? Do our buildings create well conditions for all life? When you have a framework like the ecosystem services framework, which is essentially, you know, things like pollinator support, biodiversity support, how much soil is being built each year, how much uh, nitrogen and phosphorus is being cycled each year, you're asking yourself questions that Normally, we would never ask that of our buildings. You know, how much nitrogen and phosphorus are you cycling, right? But in asking that question, you might actually wind up with composting toilets. You might wind up with green roof that, you know, you're looking at the soil and building soil there, building soil on every surface that you possibly can, right? If you're sequestering, if you're asking to sequester carbon, to have these buildings sequester carbon dioxide, you might use the coral reef inspired concrete from Blue Planet, a company called Blue Planet in California, that's bubbling CO2 through, through brine to create uh, limestone and the raw materials for concrete and road aggregate, but it sequesters CO2. You might use timbers in your interior 
right, to sequester CO2, sustainably grown timbers. That's something we didn't ask ourselves before. And I think if we're going to be a welcome species on the planet, you get to stay here when you learn to fit in. And learning to fit in means being a contributor to all the cycles, actually a welcome contributor, positive benefits for all. To move from Mumbai to Northern California, I'm a forest dweller dedicated to the biodiversity of the coast redwood forest. And I was just delighted to read about the concept of hydraulic redistribution in a recent interview with you. And I'm wondering if you could explain this concept of hydraulic redistribution and bio irrigators. It's super important. It's a new word. I haven't heard it very much. You know, as, as biomimics, we're constantly looking at organisms and learning about their superhero powers, right? What they can do. Hydraulic redistribution is, it was first noticed in the Amazon, actually, because researchers at Berkeley noticed that even though it hadn't rained, you know, the rainforest does have dry seasons, even though it hadn't rained for a while, there were still clouds forming above the trees. The trees were still transpiring. And where did that come from, right? What was happening there? And they found out that in the rainforest, you, you know, we think about the shallow rooted trees, but there are some deep rooted shrubs, and these are called bio irrigators. And they're deep rooted, and what happens is during the rainy season, they do have shallow roots as well, and they take in the water from the shallow roots, and they actually push that water down the root, counterintuitively, down the root, and then out into the soil where they bank that water. 10% of all annual rainwater uh, is banked in this way. And then during the dry season, that water moves into the tap root. It goes up and it goes out the shallow roots of these shrubs thereby watering the forest around them. And they're, the bioirrigators are throughout the forest. And, you know, I can imagine a time, especially in a climate-stressed world, where we would begin to plant bioirrigators, you know, in our landscape, now that we know about them. I mean, this is what I talk, what I mean by generosity, is that these bioirrigators are not just keeping the water, they're pushing the water out into the soil around them, the upper layers, and and uh, and watering the trees around them, which is really interesting. It it goes against this idea that you know nature red in tooth and claw, as Tennyson said. It looks more like, as we learn about the wood wide web and things like bioirrigators, it looks like the system, you know, creating conditions conducive to life in the system, has been rewarded by natural selection over long periods of time. Our, our new move in agriculture, for instance, for a long time we've been focused on the plant, so focused that we're even genetically engineering the plant. And I think the next stage for us needs to be to learn to help the helpers, you know, those myriad microbes that are in symbiotic relationship with plants and helping them do everything from germinate on time to resist pathogens to get phosphorus and water and exchange alarm signals among plants. I mean, these helpers, including the bioirrigators, maybe our job is not to quote unquote manage <laughs> any longer, but rather to be in this role of helping the helpers. What do the microbes need? What do the bioirrigators need? 
to do the job that they have done over long periods of time, right, to keep the system healthy and humming. It's a different role for us uh, as Western industrial (laughs) humans, you know, but we can learn it. Gosh, that hits on this question that I've been sitting with so long in the One Million Redwoods reforestation project, really questioning what is our role in large-scale restoration of damaged ecosystems, whether that's reforestation of redwoods or working in the juniper forest of New Mexico. I mean, any ecosystem really that has been damaged, which the majority of them have. And how do we not keep that human supremacist mindset on the ways that we even try to help? And it's something that I've been really sitting with. And I love this thought process of helping the helpers, supporting those who do it best. And that's not always the human. (laughs) Many times it's not. (laughs) It's akin to us now starting to take care of our microbiome in our own gut, right? Um, And I'm really happy about that because it gives people an analogy that they can understand. Um, And they can, you know, a good metaphor to warm their hands around. The biomimetic process is, you know, if if we want to learn, for instance, how to create a low energy desalination, we ask, how does nature take salt out of water? You know, every fish in the ocean is living on fresh water, but living in salt water. So the answers are there. And in the same way, when we're working at a systems level, this idea of going to a healthy ecosystem, quieting our cleverness, listening, literally saying, what is it that makes this so healthy? And learning about a healthy system and all the design principles within a healthy system, all the players, the actors, making this work well, and then creating conditions conducive to their lives in the systems that we are the human influenced settled and and systems that we're working in agriculture and in forestry. It's the stage of going to the healthy system with our notebooks open and our ears and our hearts open and learning. That's that humility step is also, it's the new scientific method for me. It is the method of going and learning from a healthy ecosystem, not just about it. There's a big difference there. And biomimicry, really, the definition of it is that you're learning from, not just about. That means a whole different set of questions. It means a different way of watching, different way of observing. It actually means, we we call it internally in our company, we call it muddy knees and epiphanies. And that's what we try to to help our our clients, we t- we do a lot of workshops in natural areas, um, and we bring people who design our world. We bring architects and material scientists and chemists and and um, physicists out into the natural world, Costa Rica and South Africa and Montana, places that they normally wouldn't go, and we have them immersed for a week. And muddy knees and epiphanies is what happens, right? We take them and we. We take them to, like, for instance, in Costa Rica, we'll take our folks to all these designers, people who have been building the same skyscraper for 30 years, right, over and over again. Not the same one, but it looks the same. (laughs) Um, And we bring them outside and we bring them to eight different habitat types. So we bring them through the mangrove forest. We bring them and we say, "What what are organisms here faced with? What are their challenges? What are their opportunities? What are their limitations? How do they adapt? And then we'll take them to, you know, a breeding bird colony with the sun baking down on rocks. And how are these organisms handling this heat and this intense UV rays? You know, how do we'll, we'll, we'll snorkel with them, right? Underwater, how are these organisms meeting, meeting their needs, right? We go to eight different places. We wind up at a 12,000 foot peak in the Paramo in uh, Costa Rica, where it's, you know, an alpine fog cold fog forest <laughs> and everything is getting down on your hands and knees and looking with, uh, you know, hand lenses. And 
seeing the, what these organisms face and what they do with the riches that they do have, it really changes people. They, they do have epiphanies. And the number one epiphany is that, you know, organisms are not all that different from this human homo sapien organism, right? We're, we're all trying to find something to eat, build our homes, power ourselves, put our kids to bed at night. And therefore, that opens the way to this different kind of scientific method, which is, can I learn from these organisms? I'm not that different. Our needs are not that different. Our ways right now are very different. So can I learn from them? And when you see a switch go on in people, that sort of humility switch, right, where their lens is forever shifted, they now see the natural world as full of consummate organisms, or consummate, consummate engineers, you know, <laughs> consummate architects in the natural world. That stance of respect also changes the way they make things in, in ways that we can't even, that's the intangible. It changes the way they design for sure, but it also changes, you know, the heart with which they design because now nature has become mentor to them. This question arises for me that our overstressed and oversimplified agricultural systems, they speak to the toxic and competitive paradigm that has left countless biological relationships compromised or, or just lost entirely. And it seems that biomimetic agriculture is often less about innovation and more about humans learning how to once again be mutualistic facilitators like you've been speaking of and for example restoring the fungal plant relationships in localized polycultures which in turn it uses less water it builds soil enhances mm -hmm. resilience and so i'm curious mm. what is your opinion on restoring historic biological partnerships in light of all that we don't know that's been lost does it make sense to fixate on restoring historic partnerships that now may be obsolete as the climate changes? Or is it more valuable to try and create conditions where opportunity for mutualistic adaptation, you know, adaptation of interspecies relationships is the greatest? I think it's the latter. I think we're at the point where, you know, just if you think about how many species are on the move right now as a result of climate change? You know, they're moving, you know, the meta studies have shown us that they're moving from south to north in order to get cool, you know, because it's getting too hot. 
they're moving their ranges. In other words, they're moving from lower elevation to higher elevation. The higher elevation organisms are having a really hard time. When you have that kind of movement going on, not everybody's going to get there and sit at the same time. <laughs> That's the fear, right? That that a, that a flower moves and its pollinator doesn't yet, right? So you're going to have, and it's bloodlessly called ecological decouplings. Um, and those are the things that really, really, really worry me. When I work and I do for climate change, I'm on the board of Drawdown and a Project Drawdown, which is a project to reverse climate change, actually, bring us back to Holocene conditions. I do it as a biologist who knows that the world that we're in right now did evolve to to excel in these conditions, right? And organisms are adaptable. Yes, they will move around, but not all of them will make it. So those historical landscapes, they can teach us a lot about what that land would be, what would be growing there. But I think we have to be a lot, lot more cognizant of the fact that the organisms that are that are inhabiting these places now maybe somewhat different. And they're trying to work out their mutualistic couplings. You know, they're trying to imagine moving up into a new range and all of the adaptation that you have, have to do, right, to, those, to that climate changing condition, including the organisms that are in that habitat with you. So creating healthy conditions for them is really, I think, what we can do. I think that there's, there's a move towards uh, looking at functional traits of plant life, for instance, rather than fixating on species types. So when we're working with our urban planners, for instance, we're looking at what are the landscape attributes. We have an iPad enabled app that allows us to go into the reference habitat, look at landscape attributes that are causing things like cooling temperatures in the summer. It's a certain amount of shade cover certain amount of leafy feria index. And then when we go back to the built world site, we say, look, try to create this amount of leaf area index, right? And and you can do that with perhaps different species, right? But the, the functional traits, and of course, using natives as much as you possibly can, because they are food and nesting and shelter sites for organisms. That is super, super important. But the functional traits now, a lot of restoration ecologists are looking at these do you have these functional traits, even if you're, unfortunately, the kind of tree that used to be able to survive there doesn't survive there, can't survive there anymore. You know, in the Southwest, they're saying we've got 40 years before the pinyon pines are gone. So what is the function of the pinyon pine? And we have to get really smart about that. It is a changing, it's a changing world. It is. So then the function that is most selected for is going to be adaptability. And so how do we create conditions in which organisms can exercise their adaptive qualities? So in other words, that means don't overstress them by overgrazing or give them something that they need. I mean, in some cases where I'm living in the Bitterroot Valley, that's where holistic ranching comes in where you've got actually mob grazing that mimics the buffalo and other ungulates that used to move in herds across the landscape. Can we mimic that? Because there's things happening that actually help open up that soil, create divots for water, fertilize that soil with with urine and defecation. And can we sort of recreate some of those conditions that, that led to, to healthy, diverse ecosystems? And in that case, looking back at historical regimes like fire regimes, buffalo and mob mob grazing regimes, I think those are pretty important. But the focus on individual species may have to change with climate change. Yes, I've been feeling that as well, thinking about trying to restore ecosystems to historical species arrangements say 200 years ago but we're not living in the world 200 years ago and how do we take what we understand now and apply it to what could perhaps survive and be resilient into the future grazing the rotational grazing 
led me to this other thought I wanted to ask you about bio sequestration and in this age of unnaturally plentiful atmospheric carbon we're faced with just the overwhelming question of how to best draw it back down into the earth and the soil and designs such as perennial polycultures and rotational grazing they're rising in recognition and practice and and I've also been hearing about methods that pull methane from the atmosphere to create biodegradable plastic or concrete that's assembled from CO2 and seawater. And I understand that carbon is a primary building block for life and that these techniques are earth-inspired, but I'm admittedly hesitant about more concrete and more plastic. And I want to ask, what happens when biomimetic plastic or concrete is left to degrade? Well, the, the concrete, it's basically a limestone, you know, it, it crumbles. I mean, essentially, when you take CO2 and you sequester it into limestone or concrete, you know, you're doing geo sequestration in that case. And I think it's incumbent on us to make sure that that, that we continue to use that. So in other words, when it's no longer able to be used, say, in a building and there's a pile of rubble and construction waste, can we take that limestone and then use it? I was just talking to Interface Carpets, who's a client of ours, and and they're looking at using that as a filler for some of their carpets rather than mining limestone. (laughs) They want to look at CO2 sequestering limestone and and then using, even at the end, quote unquote, end of that life, how can they use it as a filler if they're not using it in their buildings? And this idea of a circular economy, which you mentioned, is key. Because in any of these things, when you talk about making things, if you make them without any thought to what, how they are going to be remade or remanufactured or what they're going to turn into at the end of their current life, you're really not designing in a biomimetic way. Because, you know, in an ecosystem, for instance, Say you've got a a log that has fallen. We have a mistaken idea that life basically takes that log and breaks it down into its component parts, and those are then in the soil for other things. And it's it's not quite that stark as how that happens. What actually happens is that that log is then eaten by fungi. So the materials in the log get upcycled into the fungi. And then the fungi might create a mushroom and be nibbled on by a mouse. And that material gets upcycled into the mouse body. And that gets eaten by a hawk and it's upcycled into the hawk body, along with some defecation and some heat loss, right? But those materials are used again and again and again and again. They're broken apart inside the mouse body, right? And recreating the mouse cells, So if we were to really mimic in our circular economy, you wouldn't be creating lots and lots and lots and lots more biodegradable plastic, right? You would be taking that and at the end of its life, you would be turning it into something else. You know, if it's biodegradable plastic, hopefully you'd be turning it into organic carbon with the help of soil microbes, right? You'd be composting that. If it's in the technical loop, as a circular economy, folks talk about it. If it's metal, say, you would be putting it into another product. So the idea is not to make more products, but the idea is to get the products into into cycles in which those materials of one product are put into another product quickly. Life has those, life has very, very quick uh, fluxes, they're called where you go from all of a sudden you're you know you're you're sitting in a as cellulose and then you're turned into fungi that's a very close flux it isn't like the cellulose is taken apart and it's transported somewhere to a landfill right where then it'll be picked up it happens right it happens right there it happens locally so i'm really excited about things like 3d printing because i'm hoping that we'll be using local raw materials and we'll be able to take those local raw materials and print them into a new product you know when you go into your neighborhood kitchen store 
you'll bring in a spatula that's broken, they'll put it into the 3D printer, an enzymatic bath will take that, and then instantly it'll be brought back to life as a spoon or as another spatula. With little leakage of material, you don't see a lot of leakage out of a healthy forest. You know, it's using the material and reusing it over and over. That again is biomimicry at the, at the systems level. It's not about creating more and more stuff. We, for 20 years now, we've been trying to answer, you know, what would nature do here and, and asking, you know, how does nature working for people like Patagonia and saying, you know, how does nature repel water? It doesn't use Teflon, you know, and then we go and we learn in as many different ways as we can. Amoeba through zebra, we call it. How do bacteria repel water? How do fungi, how do plants, how do, right? And and then we bring those to the to the inventors. But those incredible design principles are our scientific heritage. They are our commons. We feel really strongly about that. So it, it worried me to think that, you know, people might be learning how a gecko walks on walls. And then they might want to patent how a gecko walks on walls and then be the only one who can make a tape or whatever, a non-toxic adhesive. That would be an example of patenting the scientific knowledge. And I was worried about that because, you know, we can bring a bacterium to the patent office. And if we've changed one gene, we can patent it and own it. How do you keep this from happening with nature's ideas, with nature's designs? So what we were told early on when we asked a lot of lawyers this, is that, you know, the way a gecko walks is written up in the scientific papers but it's not published in a, in a design context there because it may just be a paper about geckos and how they attract mates. And on the side, it might be talking about how they walk, right? How they stick to walls. So they said, what you want to do is you want to publish that scientific information in a design context. And then it becomes prior art, what's called prior art, which keeps people from patenting the method of how a gecko walks. They can patent a tape that they make, but they can't patent the gecko itself or the way it walks. And so that's when we started asknature.org, which is a, a website that tries to, we're trying to organize biological information by design and engineering and management function, by functions. So how does nature cooperate and up comes biological strategies or how does nature adhere to surfaces, up comes the gecko. The fact that we have it published in a design context uh, protects it. So we are trying, so I would encourage everybody, it's a wiki kind of a form and you can also upload strategies of organisms that you love. And just by putting them in a design context, that is what might we learn from this the minute you answer that question, it becomes protected. That's important to us. So important. Thank you for sharing that. I feel like a lot of people in the audience need to know that. I think a lot of people <laughs> in general need to know that information. And it's really something that we believe in it for the wild is open source information, especially when it's for the betterment of the entire earth. So thank you yeah. for making sure that yep. we heard that. And to go back to carbon sequestration, I would just really love to hear your thoughts on why industrial reforestation is not the most effective way to sequester carbon. And how can reforestation efforts be more biomimetic? Unfortunately, you know, this idea of plantation growth, <laughs> trees and plantations, right? This is part of the human, our tendency is to focus on one parameter like growth or growth rate as, you know, as a proxy for sequestering more carbon. Well, we now know it's, it's more complicated than that, right? And that if you want, if you want healthy soils, which is what we're actually the lion's share of the carbon will be stored. You need deep rooted species. You need a variety of root lengths, and depths. You need a diverse amount of species that are in turn feeding their sugars and starches to a diverse 
microbial ecology. It's that diversity that allows us, that will allow us to store carbon even in years that are dry or unusually wet. There's two kinds of diversity in natural ecosystems. And one is response diversity, which is there's enough diversity of different kinds of species that with different kinds of capabilities, some of them are really good in dry conditions. Some of them are really good in wet conditions. That response diversity uh, is what we need. So having one species of plantation tree is not the way to do that. The other kind of diversity is called functional diversity. And that's looking out at my pasture right now, of native grasses. And if we just had native grasses, it wouldn't have functional diversity. We also have to have legumes. We have to have nitrogen fixers. More than one kind of nitrogen fixer, you know, you've got lupines as well, right? You've got, then you've got response diversity. So you never only have one nitrogen fixer. So when we, again, when we start to think functionally of how these you know, mapping the relationships and looking, asking each of these organisms, what are you doing? What are you doing? What are you doing? You start to realize really the map of, of what it takes to, to have a healthy ecosystem, come what may. And we've learned enough from industrial agriculture, one species for miles, pesticides killing everything in the soil. We've learned how brittle that is. And so to apply that to forestry is a, is a repeating the sins of our fathers and mothers, right? Um, so I'm glad we had this conversation. Me too. I know we'll see each other yeah. at some point. Yeah, I can't wait to meet you in person. Well, enjoy yeah. the spring, the springing spring. And um, <laughs> yeah. I will right now. Yeah, All right. enjoy it's your day. Bye. Thank yeah. you. Bye, thank you. It's high on a mountain, the warm winds are blowing, and where the winds are blowing to, there ain't no way of knowing. The mountain grass is short, it's drying close to burning, crying out for water. As the seasons Thank you for listening to For the Wild podcast. I'm Ayana Young. The music you heard today were submissions from our community with Veed Geiger with Conflated and Samuela Akert with Garden of Dreams. Our theme music is Silence Returns by Bo and Like a River from Kate Wolf. I'd like to thank our amazing team, our producers March Young and Andrew Storrs, our research director Madison Magolski, and media director Molly Lebo. If you haven't already, rate us on iTunes so that we can keep spreading these messages further and further. Thanks so much, and until next time. Sweet smell of the pine, tall western cedar, drifting on the wind, through the mountains like a river. Nothing but the sound. The jaybird's calling. My mind grows dry and thirsty. As the memories linger, drifting on the wind through the mountains like a river. Sweet smell of pine, tall western cedar, drifting on the.